Um, a couple of the uh, messages, you know, so so um, while we're waiting, I was going to um, also tell a joke. So the title that you gave um, my talk today was uh, Return of the Jedi. I want to make it known that that was not the title that I chose. But, um, that sounds a little uh, a little, a little, a little bright though. Um, but uh, because of the uh, theme, uh, I've included some, uh, some Star Wars themes. So hopefully uh, some of you are Star Wars fans uh, or uh, some of you were alive in Star Wars. Uh, uh, or at least Return of the Jedi uh, came out. Friends will see. Um, and uh, the joke I'm going to tell, I've got to give credit to uh, Dr. Gutman, who is the, who has, who has the best repertoire of jokes. So I'm going to try to get this right. So if you're a statue in a Star Wars shop, statues in a Star Wars shop, uh, what, do you, what do you call that? Is that the right one? Statue in a Star Wars shop, what do you call a statue in a Star Wars shop? Mannequin Skywalker. Mannequin Skywalker. So. <laughs> Much as possible while they're being transported. 
uh, really uh, uh, yeah, thinking about other ways that we can uh, improve on that. And again, this is Helsinki, Finland, which is not related at all to rural central Virginia, so sort of thinking outside the box a little bit. We were doing Telstra at the time, and uh, sort of had this idea, well, if we're doing Telstra from a stationary endpoint to a hospital, why can't we just channel that maybe into the pre-hospital setting? And that's sort of where, where we got a lot of uh, research going that I'm going to tell you about that I do. It's a 1998 press release from the University of Maryland. And, uh, a group led by uh, Marianne Lamont actually started uh, thinking about this idea of doing telemedicine ambulances all the way back then. The problem? 1998, uh, they could send about two still images uh, every one minute uh, because there was really no high speed internet. Everything had this weird buzzing noise when you try to dial into the internet. And uh, so, conceptually, this was a really cool idea, but it wasn't ready for prime time. Uh, and, and then, over the years, there were a couple of little small feasibility studies, mainly out of Europe, uh, with varying degrees of success. So, so, we sort of came up with the idea of um, myself and my one of my uh, one of our short fellows, Rita Chapman Smith, who's now a faculty member at VCU, uh, about whether we could we could sort of uh, bring this into mode using mobile technology, uh, modern 4G cellular networks in our area, and do uh, pre-hospital neurological assessment in the field. The study uh, title uh, is called ITRI, and uh, our goals were to try to improve the accuracy of pre-hospital stroke diagnosis, facilitate patient triage, and reduce stroke onset to treatment times, and then also maybe as a tool for any suppressed research. And um, I was asked to show a little video, um, so shamelessly I'm going to, uh, it's not a long video, um, but it's a little cheesy, so I apologize. Uh, I'm going to start about right there. So this is uh, my uh, clinical research coordinator and an EMS provider, Jack Cody, who's going to be featuring this video. There's yours truly. Um, so we use, oh, you'll see the kit here, this is an iPad. And this is actually my uh, administrative assistant uh, mocking a stroke here in the back of the ambulance. So, uh, I don't know if we have audio in here. Let's see. That we did if I exit out. Uh oh, uh, I killed it again. Well, there we go. There we go. It's all good. It's not the, the audio that's not through. Now, uh, this was a classic example of applying uh, to the wrong mechanism. 
and uh, there was an RFA from the Institute for um, Minorities and Health Disparities looking at applications of, of technology uh, to enhance health disparities. And we tried to make the argument that we were treating a rural health disparity um, and uh, sort of proposed this as a way to, to uh, ameliorate the, the geographic disparity to, uh, to the primary conference and stroke centers. And uh, they liked some of it, but they didn't like a lot of it, and uh, they did not get funded. And so this was sort of my, uh, my the first kind of uh, kind of wind out of the sales moment as far as the study goes. And instead of looking, you know, like the Jedi, I felt more like this, uh, circa 2012, 2013. Just, this is uh, going back to the original. Uh, this is Luke Skywalker here training with Yoda, and then there's things floating around that he's controlling with his mind. But I really felt upside down. I had all these ideas floating around out here, but not really have to sure how to apply them in any fun of a way. Um, and uh, uh, so then know where to go from there. So then that's where the mentor uh, is really important. So uh, my mentor, as I mentioned, is uh, Brad Whirl, MBA, he's a short geneticist, but he's a great mentor, uh, as well as Karen Johnston, uh, who is my former chair, who's a faculty member of this course, and is an original faculty member when the course was the Bell course as well. And so I got an email. Uh, this is, I like to say the emails because I'm on order. And uh, this is my the email from April 23rd, 2014, talking about this new clinical trials methodology course uh, and that we should have all applied, which I did. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so it's, yes. What movie was this? Field of Dreams. Dreams. The other great quote from this movie, if you build it, they will come. So, so we came with it uh, to Iowa for the clinical trials methodology. So, so, uh, so again, the value of the course for me was, uh, I think the most valuable were the small group sessions. My mentor, uh, my mentors in that session uh, were, were Dr. Gutman, um, as well as uh, uh, late statistician here, Catherine uh, Chowler, and I'll have a picture of Catherine coming up on my slides. Um, and uh, as well as Eric, I'll see here. Oh, your daddy, Eric's in the back in here. And, uh, and these guys are really essential to sort of helping me through my protocol, but just as essential as the senior mentorship, I'll call it peer mentorship in my small group uh, from the other folks that were there. Um, and uh, Narula, uh, Matthew Overson, um, uh, uh, Karen, uh, uh, Ollie Hirsch. Uh, these were great uh, you know, sort of peer mentors that helped me think through my objectives. So, so we changed things around a little bit. I had this sort of ambitious idea of doing a comparative, uh, uh, larger scale trial, and I was convinced to start off with something more achievable, like a like a basic feasibility trial. And uh, we formed this hypothesis that we could essentially uh, target innovative or agreement uh, obtained in a high short scale, a three hospital setting, compared to what we get after the patient arrives in the hospital, uh, and looking at sort of a correlation coefficient. The run of hypothesis. So I have a sort of single center, single blinded. Uh, it was a non randomized uh, uh, feasibility study where we're going to look at sort of that pre hospital diagnosis to the after hospital diagnosis using an out of scale um, and an integrator agreement correlation. And then they help me think through my eligibility criteria, um, uh, trying to uh, really refine the patient population. So we're going to look at specifically this study, uh, looking at uh, ambulance agencies that had at least 10 minutes of transport time. To, um, to enroll the right population of patients and to have enough time to do our intervention. And then we set up a little study network. The red circles here are hospitals, and our area in the black circles are EMS agencies. So essentially, we're doing a multi center trial, but in our region with EMS agencies, which, um, for those of you who have done pre hospital trials, will, uh, 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 let's see, uh, Jeff say here anymore, this is really hard to do, particularly in rural EMS ambulance agencies. Uh, each of which are their own little countries, sort of like the sites in the clinical trial. Um, but it was a great uh, learning environment to, to try to understand multi center, or at least EMS uh, multi center type research. And then the other thing that I really learned from the course was to try to simplify my protocol as much as possible and to keep it really, really simple. And that's a, that's a big point of emphasis for you guys is to try to make your protocol as simple as possible to achieve your, uh, your aims. In our case, uh, we essentially would have EMS notify our medical communication system if they had a potentially eligible subject. Um, and for them, simple was whether they had a positive Cincinnati or a or not, or a standard screening exam. 
Uh, and then our medical communications system would send an alert to our study team, and then we would call them at the back of the ambulance. They would answer the call, and, um, and we, would, we would do our exam. Uh, and then the other really helpful thing for me was trying to define a sample size. And I really didn't know how to do this. Uh, I, knew, uh, I know a little bit about the methodology of sample size calculations for more standard sort of compared to drug trials, but not for something where you're looking at diagnostic uh, agreement uh, between two sort of uh, scales. And, uh, and so this helped me sort of think about a study that uh, we would need to enroll roughly 50 patients and sort of achieve this, this goal of correlation of the NIH pre-hospital setting and after hospital Bible to get a, to answer the question. And there's there's Kathleen there. I thought I'd um, put her picture in because she was a really rigorous uh, statistician and uh, and even just like you guys, even before we showed up in Iowa, Lori and Catherine were giving me great feedback on my ideas and on my synopsis and then that continued on where she, uh, she of course had passed away shortly thereafter uh, the, uh, the the course. Um, Okay, and then the other important thing for me um, was so how to think about informed consent for y'all still say. Uh, so uh, you guys have heard a lot, uh, uh, I think, from Roger on sort of informed consent and various aspects of exemption for informed consent. Um, and, uh, um, and so we were trying to think about how to do that. Of course, I was able to achieve the exemption from informed consent for that feasibility phase of the study. Um, so we did a little, a little trial. Uh, we had uh, roll 39, uh, totally uh, uh, 57 active patients, and then 39 that we were able to measure the uh, impact on the nitro scale. Uh, we achieved the median uh, English transport time of 25 minutes, uh, with connectivity time of roughly 10 minutes, and had a good correlation of our nitro scale from pre hospital setting to after hospital arrival um, at a uh, 0.76 correlation. And then published a couple of papers. Um, that and that was nice uh, to, to get those out there. And then uh, the other output from the clinical trials methodology course, uh, so we ultimately uh, put together about five related manuscripts, a couple that are impressed. Um, we supported research from multiple students and trainees uh, through uh, scholarships from the American Heart American Stroke Association, uh, given a couple of platform presentations at uh, national meetings, uh, several state meetings on stroke systems of care, presented before the Brantac Coalition at NIH, which was really neat. And then lastly, uh, um, after we uh, developed a protocol uh, in September of 2014, we were able to use that as part of a, a large application to the Health Resources and Services Administration to get a nice grant that uh, has been supporting the research over the last several years, uh, in addition to a broader goal of looking at aspects of application of emergency teleology uh, uh, and telestroke and rural settings. So then, um, the other thing that has happened since uh, since I participated in the clinical trials methodology course is uh, is the coming of age of endovascular therapy or the approval of endovascular therapy that you guys heard about in the Dawn trial that was presented earlier in the week, and this really changed uh, the way that we view the potential impact of this intervention of pre-hospital uh, mobile telemedicine, uh, and that not only do we sort of target the time to treatment and diagnostic accuracy, but we can also think about it as a triage, uh, which is an important gap area in stroke now with endovascular therapy. We don't really know how to triage people in the pre-hospital setting accurately for whether they should go to a hospital where they can get endovascular therapy or simply the first available hospital where they can get any amount of future treatment. And so uh, being able to do a neurological assessment in the field is one way that we can potentially improve on that. Uh, so um, we put together a proposal for the um, stroke minutes and uh, I had two new aims. Uh, one was simply looking at short whole set of treatment time. Um, uh, the time that a patient uh, begins with their short symptoms to when, uh, when they're able to, to um, achieve treatment. And the idea is that we would take things that normally happen in the post-hospital setting and put them in the pre-hospital setting. <laughs> and then second, uh, second aim would be to look at uh, whether we could improve on uh, the sensitivity and specificity of diagnosis of large vessel occlusion in the field compared to standard methods of pre-hospital assessment. I, I emphasize standard there because we don't really have a standard method of pre-hospital assessment for um, large vessel occlusion in the field, which is a little bit of a challenge uh, to sort of trying to get after that second aim. 
So the timeline there, uh, we set a goal for a grant submission in February of this past year. So the first thing I did was I called Laurie and Will in June of 2016. And this is, a, this is an important caveat to the value of, the, of this course, is this was two years after I had just been in the course and I was able to pick up the phone uh, and call uh, two of the mentors from the course. And they both uh, graciously donated their time to have a phone conference with me. Uh, Will shared some uh, uh, feasibility survey results from a study that they had put through the and I showed them, which was really helpful. Um, and I found that to be invaluable. I uh, was able to put together a synopsis that we submitted to the program officer, July 2016. September um, 2016, I presented to the acute uh, acute uh, stroke working group, and uh, Dr. Cotri and Jeff Saber, the co-chairs of that committee, so I was extremely grateful to them uh, because they also, similar to the, to the feedback I got in the methodology course, where you review my synopsis and provide feedback, um, very helpful. And then we completed plans for protocol and budget in November of, of, of 16. And then when it came down to February, I decided not to see that. Um, and so uh, uh, there's several reasons behind that. But um, one, uh, I did not feel in, uh, at the end of the day that the protocol was where I wanted to be. I, didn't, I was worried about its uh, likelihood of success when it went to study session. And also whether or not it's exactly the kind of study that we wanted to do. And so, um, I don't want to discourage you guys from submitting your grants because one of my body messages is going to be you need to submit your grants. Uh, but I'll also say that um, you really want to be comfortable and ready, at least in my opinion, uh, uh, before you go in. I just didn't feel like we were ready to go in. In addition to other life things that were going on around that time that made it complicated. So here you go, one more. You don't know what you mean. <laughs> so back to the drawing board. So now, sort of, uh, um, where we are is sort of retooling or uh, the concept of, of my method uh, as a tool, potentially, rather than an intervention of itself. Uh, so, as an example, um, it can be used to do external validation of these new quote unquote large vessel occlusion sensitive screening scales. Um, we are working with a, a, a local pharmaceutical company, potentially uh, using a, a novel nerve protection drug to implement it in the hospital setting. Uh, using this tool as a way to, uh, to facilitate uh, the intervention. Um, uh, and then we're also uh, uh, set, setting up a partnership with the engineering institution to do some cool computational video analysis, looking at neurological science with machine learning, uh, and that's facilitated through the video evaluation of back payments. And we actually have a uh, hoping to put in uh, R01 for that uh, this year as well. Um, and so, uh, so where is it? Sprouted in one direction following participation in the clinical trials methodology course. So we get some grant funding to do the, the first sort of feasibility study or feasibility trial. Uh, uh, it has some good nice academic productivity out of it. Uh, I think that's supported to constantly you know, reassess and uh, potentially get out of the drawing board if uh, if they're not ready to put the grant. So life after the, the course. So uh, these are a couple of public service announcements and just some just some words to why. So, so one, I think it's really important to develop the protocol. It's easy at the course and at the conference to have all these good vibes about what you're doing to uh, really focus a lot of your attention, a lot of your time, while you're here to developing your protocol. But as soon as you all go back um, to your institutions, time is going to run away from you. Uh, all your other competing demands uh, are going to, to uh, become encroaching again. So it's really key to not uh, take your eye off the ball once you have that final protocol in, uh, uh, and, and the leadership here is going to uh, be committed to trying to do as many as possible to complete the finalized protocol, then it's much easier to package that into your grant submission uh, and, and hopefully into a methods paper or in additional publications. The extended mentorship, I can't say enough about. So again, uh, I've done uh, myriad sort of uh, one day uh, courses even in my master's program looking at clinical research methodology, but the extended mentorship in my own field that I've received through the course um, has been essential. Um, and also the main contacts that I previously otherwise would not have made. Uh, Robert Conley was also in my small group and, and others uh, you know, through the uh, NIH, et cetera. I've just been uh, it's been nice to have that, that sort of uh, to know people that you're, you'll potentially be working with and being new 
mind when you ultimately go into these submissions. Um, uh, combative gatherings, I found that to be really helpful. So each year at the academy, uh, as Will mentioned, there's a little gathering. You can come back and see the folks you can just make the course with, uh, present the work, give updates on what you're doing. Um, I think that uh, um, one of the challenges in our, in our collective fields is, um, is burnout, uh, whether you're a clinician or a researcher. And to me, one of the best uh, anecdotes for burnout is a sense of community beyond just your own individual departments. Um, and, that's, and this program offers a sense of community that's extensive. And so I encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, for Sam, I, 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 I wanted to make sure that you guys all remember to do your surveys. Um, they're going to survey you regularly to see what you're doing, see what kind of progress you're making. I think probably my guess is probably one of the number one reasons people look at the survey is because they don't want to admit they haven't done much um, and or they're worried that they haven't published or something like that. But that's, I don't think the point. The point is, is I think it's, it's critical for this course and frankly the funding mechanism supporting the course to be able to follow the outcomes uh, of the intervention, which is uh, your career, your productivity, you know, your successes, your searchers, uh, or other ones, and so, so I encourage you all to do that, uh, as well as your evaluations. And then publish. Um, it's, uh, and actually my next slide will talk a little bit about time management, but uh, I think that's critical to, to keeping the momentum moving forward, publishing and submitting your brand. And then lastly, just sort of some pitfalls to success. Time management, I think we all agree, is, is probably one of the biggest ones I mentioned. Sort of my uh, uh, role as a residency program director, so time management is really important for me, um, and uh, I'm trying to make sure I protect the time I do have to do research. Uh, death by 5,000 emails, I think we all can agree that that is a, uh, uh, a real challenge. And uh, if you've ever looked at the little four quadrant box of urgent, important, not urgent, not important, it's kind of everybody know what I'm talking about. Yeah, right. Uh, so, so that's where you really sort of delineate kind of the day-to-day -day putting out fires of email to the is just wasting time sitting down and writing something. And if you can sort of accept the realization that if you're writing, whether it's a manuscript or a grant, then you're always being productive with your time uh, if, you're, if part of your time is to do research. Um, whereas if you come to the office and look like I've been many days and you spend a couple hours just going through emails, you feel like you really haven't accomplished anything by the time you're done and all this time is gone by. But you never feel that way if you work on even if you've written one sentence. Um, so keep that in mind. The AP ratio, does anybody know what the AP ratio is? That's your abstracts to publication ratio. Um, so one of my former chairs, Fred Wooten, said you want your AP ratio to be as close to one as possible. Um, so who's AP ratio is close to one? There you go, I like that. That's good. If you could keep an AP ratio of one, then you're in good shape. Lack of mentorship. If you don't have good mentorship at your institution, Reach out to the outside our institution and establish a community of mentorship. Again, another good my product of the clinical trials methodology course. And then I think this one's really important, imposter syndrome. Anybody have imposter syndrome? Yeah. So you sit around and you see folks from, you know, uh, places uh, that we all consider to be um, reputable, you know, uh, the, the paragons of, you know, of clinical research. And you think, well, maybe I'm just not, you know, I don't have the pedigree or the CV or the background to be one of those folks, but, but you, you are, and I think it's, uh, it's important each day to remind yourself that you have all the tools you need to be successful with that. Uh, a well-written uh, uh, protocol, a, a well-thought-out hypothesis, um, a well-written manuscript it doesn't require any sort of, uh, any sort of uh, credentials that, um, that it's, it's, it's sort of agnostic to that. And so you guys, if, uh, if you can just apply Hard work and ingenuity can be just as successful as anyone. So don't let imposter syndrome consume you. Untapped enthusiasm, I think that's also important. So you'll leave the course of your <coughs> enthusiasm, and again, it's uh, it's time you know to strike while that enthusiasm is hot, and not let it to dissipate over time as, as time uh, separation from this experience. And then overcommitting and under delivering. So saying yes to too many things. Really focus on that one uh, key area of research. That that, that gets you out of there when you're feeling inside. And then lastly, just point out immersion. Sometimes just uh, that alone can be an impediment to being smart. So I'll sort of end there because I want to open up for some questions and answer uh, uh, time. But uh, I also wanted to share this last sort of thought 
Um, so I think it's uh, nothing uh, is more immediately relevant to this course than, than this quote from uh, uh, our former uh, stroke uh, director, Clark Haley, who retired this past year and was also one of the founding faculty members of the Bell course um, on the trials methodology. He uh, received the Sherman Award for Lifetime Achievement Stroke this past year. And this was uh, and then published uh, the comments from his speech at uh, in the Stroke Journal. This is what Clark said. It's pretty, pretty simple and basic. Clark fashion, but uh, I'll, I'll read it. Although there is certainty, certainly a role for patient experience, uh, uh, data, knowledge, statistics, and observational research in a variety of circumstances, when it is really crunch time, we must insist on consistent and persuasive evidence that in most cases can only be provided by properly designed and executed randomized, concurrently controlled, and as much as possible blinded clinical trials. Um, so keep that in mind. Clay also gave me a very inspirational line. Uh, 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 career success speech one time when I first uh, uh, finished my fellowship. Uh, I asked him, I said, how do you, you know, what's the key to success uh, for a proof life in a career? He said, there are three things. Grants and publications, grants and publications, grants and publications. And I said, thank you for that inspiring talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this last, uh, this last statement, I think it's important to constantly reinvent yourself. Uh, and, uh, and, before your patent expires. Uh, we all sort of start off with this fresh, you know, original kind of feeling of, of our ideas, of our, of our um, you know, that we can change the field. And I think you have to reinvent yourself or you'll, you'll um, you know, continue to, uh, um, to potentially uh, not uh, give yourself the most uh, potential for success. So that I'll leave you with my last Star Wars uh, theme and happy to answer any questions about my experience. So again, I can't say enough. Uh, about the, um, what I received in the course, uh, and uh, again, the opportunity to come back and continue to receive the tuition today the day about the work that I'm doing. And I hope you guys all have the same experience. So, thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. Um, So you got your Twitter handle there. Mm. Yes, yeah, social media also very important. Um, so uh, uh, I'm not a huge uh, tweeter, is that the right word? Um, but uh, I do find it to be pretty helpful to stay in touch with um, you know, what's going on in various uh, main public uh, journals and uh, um, various organizations, etc. Um, what other questions can I answer? If you have a uh, if you direct message Delta through Twitter, they answer faster than other any other method. The other thing I um, and actually I answer faster than any other method. If you send me a direct message on Twitter, I've declared email bankruptcy, so I will answer your emails eventually. But email is a time machine for me. I'm sort of like I'm in, I'm in mid July, I think is where. I'm. Yeah, I mean I think that's the depth I've got you know, so, um, If you you have to um, you have to cut off the email. What do you guys keep a catalog of protocols from previous participants um, as examples? So I guess that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we haven't because you know, we've been relatively new, and also we want we. That's been one thing that we've struggled with, and I there's been a grant that I've been submitting um, over the entire actual course of this course that I did finally get funded that actually I'm going to turn into an example that we can we can use in the trial. Uh, or in the, in the course, but you know, part of it is we don't want to. You know, we haven't gone back to people and say, "Hey, you know, did you use? You know, did this actually get funded and get used?" Because I think from the you know sort of transparency research perspective, I always would like to publish my protocol along with the, the paper, even if I'm doing an observational study. So um, perhaps we could get your uh, your your I treat protocol since you've done that at least primary analysis. And, I think that'd be a good example for people. I think it would also be nice if it had like all the track changes from the beginning. That would be. Well, that did have the original track changes. It looks like a smart blow. Yeah. <laughs> in the early days, I mean, we have to be careful in it. So in the early days of the Bell course, we did that one year. We had like an example protocol, and we got like 30 versions of that protocol back. So there's like there's advantages of seeing one, but then there's disadvantages of that. Being what the parent look like regardless of what it is. And one of the things we, we've 
we've also, one of, one of our sort of, um, I think, missed opportunities is when we've had the, uh, when we had, when we've had the reunions, we've had, we've had people come back and kind of sort of recap some of their favorite moments in um, their small groups. And since we've, we've saved the videos, um, we haven't gone back to like, get the footage, but you know, theoretically, I think we have most of the videos. It should be hard to go back. But somebody, but um, Sarah Richardson, who was in her first cohort, was fondly remembers when Chris was, was first uh, discussing her first protocol. And something of the effect of like, yeah, and I remember when Chris told me, you could do it that way. <laughs> Which, which would be nice for us to plot in the videos for the uh, reunion and we'll dig through for some of the, the video tape. Yeah, so to in touch with the people in your small group, I, um, I find that to be helpful and uh, motivating uh, because when I see that they've published or, you know, or hear that they've you know, put their brand in or something like that, it, it sort of reinvigorates me to make sure that I'm, I'm keeping those around more and I'm keeping them all forward. And, uh, um, and it's just generally fun to get you sort of know a little bit about the that's the of their original idea, their original protocol, to see if they're pushing. Can I ask, um, let's say your protocol is nothing spectacular and uses just generally accepted kind of technology. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, yeah. Do <laughs> you still remember trying to have it published, and, and if so, why? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I recommend always trying to have anything published. Um, you know, leave no meat on the table, so to speak. That was another uh, good recognition for the week. Um, but, uh, I think it's important you put a lot of work into it. Um, if you, uh, uh, if it's, you know, if there's room to improve it, I'd say definitely improve it before you try to publish it. But if you think it's as good as it's going to get, and, but in your mind, again, you have a little bit of imposter syndrome and you're sort of saying, that's ah, nothing special. Um, I think that's a, that's an, you should, you should overcome that and uh, try to publish it. Even if it's, you know, it may not be in um, the, you know, the most, um, the largest impact factor specialty or, or whatnot, but just getting published, I think, is, is nice. To see that first, you know, methods paper, one of the ones I put up there was in a journal of uh, telemedicine and e-health, and I'm scared to say what their impact factor is, but, it, you know, it was nice to see it, you know, published, peer-reviewed, um, in, in, in press, and, uh, and then be able to use that and share that with other people, particularly as I rolled the protocol out to other colleagues that were participating in the study. It was nice to say, you know, here's a paper showing exactly what we're talking about. Um, and so it, it becomes sort of a currency for uh, the, the flow of your research. And I think the, the step is that once you've got the resources to do the trial of the funded grant, that, that's probably where it makes most sense. Now, there, there are at least two journals that are actually quite um, friendly to that idea. The International Journal of Stroke. Sorry if you don't do stroke research. Um, but they are, and the idea here is, is the more you can, like similar to clinical trials back up, the more you can put out there about your methods before you finish your trial. So everybody's on the hook and say, oh, they were looking to change their primary outcome afterwards. Again, hard to do with clinical trials back up, but putting out that, you know, sort of methods type paper in the International Journal of Stroke in advance can be really good. Um, another journal that is agnostic to disease state. And by full disclosure, I'm a unpaid associate editor, editor of the Trials Journal, which is in the, it's not run by the Society for Clinical Trials, but it's in the Biomed Central. So there, it, it uses the open access, but it's one of the good guys. It's not a preparatory open access that we've all probably got five emails from today. <laughs> you, can, you can publish in the, you know, the, the Iowan Journal of Orthopedics. It's like, oh great, I don't do any orthopedics research. But the, the Trials Journal, actually has an expedited process if your protocol has undergone external peer review by way of a funding procedure. So, I mean, there is a pay, you know, it does require money to, to get published in the child's journal. But again, I don't get any share of that at all. It goes, I, can I submit my protocols for free? And they're like, no. So I was like, okay. So I, I get sort of no benefit other than helping to police the uh, academic literature in my new role as the associate editor of that journal. But I think it is good to have that out there and referenceable. I think showing people what, what's going on. And I think at the end, looking at the, the protocols and what is in them as appendices to your main papers is really important. And required for the academic journal too. So, sorry, Aaron, have you ever come across a situation where 
somebody who's reading their wall find this a good idea for a plus, thank you very much. Sounds good. Yeah, so actually that's a um, uh, that's a um, that's an interesting point. I think that is a, but that's also why it's important to publish it in your period of your state in the, the ground, even if you haven't actually done a copy or yeah, you're done, done your study yet. You'll see a lot of protocol papers get published by really close to when the actual results paper gets published. And I don't know if that's strategic or just um, you know, lack of getting the, the methods paper published or something. But um, worse than that, I think, is presenting it um, in an open form at a national meeting or like an abstract or a poster or something like that. And, um, or, you know, doing a, um, like a marketing piece for your institution. I, my institution wanted to do all these, you know, and I, and I, was, I, was, I was saying yes to everything. <coughs> Sort of press releases and you know videos about what we were doing, and I, I do feel like that um, there was the possibility of other folks seeing what we were doing and doing it themselves. And, um, uh, you can't get a little bigger than we, but I think that there's something out there about that. So the sooner you get it peer reviewed and published in a journal, I think is you can sort of establish well, I have you know I have this idea, and this is my planning. I don't know what you have any thoughts on. I'll say it's theoretically possible. Um, however, I, I don't know, you may not have looked at it, but when I give you an example protocol um, for like the adverse event reporting, the ISCAP protocol that had all this stuff about, maybe didn't look at it. Well, full disclosure, uh, it is approved. It's under an active IDE by the FDA. It's not yet been funded by the NIH or submitted because there's a few steps that have to go in before somebody wants to submit it. So if anybody wants to, you know, try to write that up and get that through NIH before me, <laughs> bring it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the bottom line is, like, in, in that sort of field, there's only so many people doing that sort of work. And you know, if if, if people were to do that, it, you know, I think it'd be nice to give opportunities for people to work together. I think it's hard enough to do clinical research and do clinical trials that actually mean something. And it, it, there are some fields where, like, like in, in theoretical physics, they're really, this is a big thing, because, I mean, they do actually just sort of sit around and think all day, right? And, and they do put these things out in preprints in advance to kind of stake down the... Don't we do that to the CERN thing all day? Yeah, but then we have to ultimately do our experiments on, on, on people. If you're in theoretical physics, you just think all day, right? Um, and, I mean, I feel like theoretical physics. My first paper was in the Journal of Chemical Physics. But so I think I, I do think openness and collaboration is good. I think if you're doing something that's super unique, you have to if it's if it involves something that's patentable or involves IP, I think you need to talk to your tech transfer office and, and be careful about what you're open with there. But in terms of like big diseases it, or even small you know, small diseases, the, the community of people doing trials is so small that the, the, you know, being open and, and talking about these things with other people is usually good. And in larger diseases, again, the number of people who would be willing or have the resources to do large-scale trials is relatively limited. So it it seems unlikely that you, you're going to be massively co-opted on things like that. I mean, I was already tickled if somebody actually found the money to do the, the trial I sent you my protocol for. So we're, we're going to work on it. but. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I'll hold it. I was noticed that you had filed a provisional patent. Yeah. Do you suppose that as a confirmation? I do. Do I have to or do I? Do you or how Yeah, you? every talk I give of anything related to that. So it's for your grant applications and the QNR. Yes. Do you plan on marketing this? So, um, so I don't plan on marketing it, um, although that first grant application I put in uh, at NIH did have a commercialization component to it. And so at that time, it was important to For me, it's really more of an intellectual property uh, uh, component. Um, the, and, I, and I frankly don't see a market for it anyway, so it's um, in its current form. It's essentially just use of stuff you can go to your garage uh, from Circuit City, uh, which is not exist anymore. But I will say this, uh, getting, um, uh, if you have any component of intellectual property um, or, you know, or a patent or anything like that with any of the research you're doing, uh, when you're interfacing with commercial entities, that can, it's also something where you do, it's good to, uh, to be a little bit more protected and to publish. We, uh, we, have, we have a partnership with Verizon Wireless um, to help us uh, enhance cellular connectivity for our study in our region, and they invited me to come speak at a conference, uh, and uh, I was there, and I met, um, and this was, you know, after we had already put a bunch of stuff out on the web about what we were doing, et cetera. 
and there was a uh, small private startup vendor there who had a um, mobile telephone system that looked a lot like ours that um, they were presenting to the horizon. So it sort of made me, you know, I was pretty naive about all this early on, and I think there are people out there that would like to take advantage of what your recollection line is. You don't feel that your exposure to the had adversely impacted your grant score compared to R42? Um, no, not, to, not for that. Again, it specifically had a, a commercialization component, so I think that was important for that particular mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, certainly the folks from, from NIDS could comment that that's something that you're concerned about. But I haven't been worried about it once again, not from here, but um, in my case. So, but it's a reasonable question. And I think it's important, clearly, to explore that kind of stuff. All right. Maybe time for one more question if we have one for our returning gentleman. All right, Dr. Sutherland, thank you. All right, we're going to move.